Jumpstart Historic Horizons is the latest magic set to bring digital exclusivity to magic. By adding brand new cards that can't be bought as singles and don't exist anywhere in paper, not only are the playing game mechanic implications dramatic, so too are the effect this has on the game's narrative. Welcome to Magic the Flavoring, the Magic the Gathering podcast, where we talk about all things magic, flavor design and lore. I am your host, Andy Mann. Hello, this is Nathan Cancel. And we are going to be talking today about, uh, I'm going to get the name right, uh, Jumpstart Historic Horizons. <laughs> Which, wow, what a name. Uh, Jumpstart Historic Horizons is an arena-exclusive format, uh, obviously extending Jumpstart, which was in paper and on Arena. Um, And this is directly from the Card Image Gallery article from Wizards of the Coast, uh, arriving August 12th on MTG Arena. Jumpstart Historic Horizons adds hundreds of cards from Modern, uh, Modern Horizons, Modern Horizons 2, and beyond, plus all new Magic the Gathering cards to MTG Arena. Now, <laughs> mm. what was like one of the massive things that all the people who were detracting against Arena when it first popped up? What was like their biggest thing where they were like, "This will be the death of Magic: The Gathering." It's divergent uh, play, play, play styles, divergent formats, divergent availability yep. of cards. Yep. Um, yeah, just two different fucking games, just two Andy. Different games, mate. <laughs> just two fucking different games. <laughs> Let's just do it. Why not? <laughs> yeah, fuck it. What did you say before we started recording? We Hearthstone now. <laughs> yeah, we Hearthstone now, boys. Let's go. <laughs> I heard you liked RNG in your game, so we, so we added the only aspect of Hearthstone that people begrudged from the game and put it into magic, even though it didn't oh need it. Oh my gosh. Why not? Now, oh, I will say, funny. like, there is so much discourse around what this means for magic as a game, and what whether it's a good thing or a bad thing and where the pros and cons lie and whether this is something that ever should be done or whether it's, you know, interesting new design space and blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of play stuff. And obviously, as Nathan and I are magic players, we could absolutely do a whole episode on that and still, like, be relatively knowledgeable despite the fact that this isn't, a like, a Mel podcast, right? This is We're not talking about, like, the playability. We are going to stick to the Vorthos stuff because obviously that's what we want to do. And... Even in that regard, there is still so much sort of philosophical musings, I suppose, we could we can put on the idea that there's there's new art. It's not just these aren't just like oh they've put some cards in and oh well, these these may be cards that we want available. There's like actual new cards with new art that will not be in paper. And there's like story implications and there's Things like the fact that these cards don't tend to have like flavor text or whatever else, and there's like known characters coming back, and it 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 feels really weird, right? Just off the bat, I'm just gonna say it feels really weird that these are not gonna be in paper, but I don't know why. I guess it's because it's I, I don't want to say it's baseline FOMO, right? I don't want to say it's just oh I don't get to play with these cards. It's more that certain things like i mean let's 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 uh, address the elephant in the room like we're getting a davriel kane planeswalker yes. right and an interesting one arguably his shadow mage but um planeswalker card was a bit underwhelming from what the spark one he didn't really have any pa- uh, like implications within the story that we really saw like i don't even think we got like a, f- a full paragraph on him right in the in he the didn't story get line. a lot of time in so, one spark name yeah, so getting a, a card of his when we've obviously known about him for a while, um, Children of Nameless is one of like the best um, uh, books out um, books out there in terms of like uh, story depth mm. um, and audience appreciation. And the first time we actually get to see his face on a magic card, the first time we get to see his abilities outside of a okay, here's a minus and a static ability, not particularly nuanced. Um, it's it's stuck on stuck on arena and and it's not even it's stuck on arena. It's a card that you can't physically like proxy up and play. Not even like. Working around, because uh, we'll talk about the abilities that they're introducing in a second, but one of the abilities is perpetually, and it's on the card, and like, cool, you could technically kind of make that work in paper. One of his abilities just simply is impossible to play outside of Arena, mm. and it's just, if you, for whatever reason, really, really like this character, resonated with this character, really want to play with play this play with this um, with this character, it's almost like we've just gone, ah, what well, tough. Go go get go, go get Arena, mm. and then hope hope that you open the right pack. Because this is the other thing, right? It's, it's not just like. The, the, the fact that we're introducing cards is that jump starts inherently a random format in terms of how you open the packs yeah. anyway and the packs that you get so it feels very much like 
Hearthstone meets treasure chests, you know, from like, like you have to kind of, you have to kind of guess at what you're going to get anyway. And then even the cards that you get keep you guessing. When there you is no them. way I guess you that's buy the idea. these cards as singles in any capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Which it seems really annoying if you really want to like build around it or really want to try the card out. Again, for those that play Arena, like that's fantastic, amazing. And if you, but even then for you, if you really, really want to play this card or really want to play this particular style, you have to, again, kind of get lucky in, in, in being able to play it or wild cards it or whatever. And, you know, Arena Economy is a whole other conversation. So I guess it just feels, yeah, it's just accessibility, mm. right? And this is one of these things that I think is always a big issue is that we everyone just wants the ability to play with the different things that Wizards produces. And then having kind of this barrier. I think is a thing that makes it feel weird before you even get into, you know, the actual, as you say, like the Mel side of it, like the playability of the cards or the, 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 the way that they're addressing these abilities or the way they're presenting these abilities. Fuck actually any of that. It's just a matter of, but I want to play it and sure. I can't guarantee to do that. Um, we're going to be a little bit careful when we talk about which cards are what, because spoilers are at the moment happening. And uh, congrats, by the way, to our friend uh, Matt from Total MTG, um, who's got a preview card for the set. Excellent. So they're doing, I mean, they're doing previews. Like the people are getting preview cards for mm. this set, right? Which is kind of an interesting sort of thing to say. Um, but we can say, as far as like named characters go, uh, we are getting new Davriel card. Um, there has been art shown, and I think there is. I I don't want to say what the card uh, sort of does because actually I don't know where it was spoiled. Um, but there is card art for a new Cura that uh, Magali Villeneuve shared. Mm. So I'm guessing that was okay to do so. And there's a new Sarkin card as well, Sarkin uh, Vol. So. They're, I guess they're not like narrative, narratively impactful characters at this time. So I suppose it's sort of okay in that respect. My, so my, my big thing when people talk about uh, the exclusivity of these cards, and especially, especially if we are just looking at them as theoretical game pieces, as opposed to, well, I want to build a physical, like you know, modern deck or a physical commander deck using these cards. If we're just talking about them as like the information that that card exists. They still exist just as much as any other magic card that I've not physically held in my hand. Do you know what I mean? To me, true. Yeah, I can still see the artwork and I can still see the PDFs of the cards and what they do. I know who the artists are. I know what the abilities are and the flavor implications. If I'm coming at this just from a purely Vorfosian standpoint, it, in terms of my knowledge of the game and its storyline and its artwork... That hasn't actually changed. It is still more, right? It's still increased information. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so yeah. Well, like, I mean, that's, that's the reason I sort of say it like that, and like it sounds like fairly sort of like, well, then that's done, dusted. It doesn't matter. The reason I say it like that is is because we never actually on this podcast have really spoken about the concept where where when we talk about lots of the artwork, especially in sort of like more recent sets where either you buy it or you don't, because obviously the older cards, even though they're sort of somewhat rare in some cases, a lot of the time, if you've got like a big battle of back catalog of cards, you can kind of filter through and eventually you'll find like one of the older cards, if that makes sense. So like, you know, you might have actually physically seen and physically held the majority of magic cards, like despite the fact there are thousands of them. But in, in most recent sets, for example, if I've not been buying into them, I haven't physically held a lot of these cards. And even sets that I did buy, like Strixhaven, I didn't buy a huge amount of it. I bought the bundle, I got a commander deck, and I bought a whole bunch of singles. I've not physically held a complete set of Strixhaven in my hand. But I do know about all of the art and all of the cards, and we've spoken about them, and we've spoken about them in, as their implications to the story. But it does still feel strange. There is still something in the back of my mind that's like, well, but it's not. It's almost like it's non-canon. Is it? Is that a way to say it? Right. Are they real? Is it real magic? Because I guess with everything else, it kind of ties into it. it does feel like it's divorced straight. So there's, there's that, that. There's a feeling of it being divorced from the main, the main game. I guess. But I mean, it's, I guess one of the things we're not going to get a story arc for them, right? Like, there's not necessarily, as you say, the lack of flavor text is actually kind of the thing, the biggest thing here, where you just don't get context of these cards without, like, kind of assuming something or or kind of creating your own little head cannon. There's no there's no confirmation mm. of where is Kiora, why is Sarkin on Shiv, when is it? I mean, you can kind of tell by the like the little flex in his hair that this is Sarkin unbroken. Like, this is after all of the events of. Um, um of, of Tarkir. Mm. Um and after the events, I guess, of I guess we don't know if it's after the events of War of the Spark, but I mean he's at he's at the latter point of his of his development so mm. far. Like we he's clearly the red, blue, green planeswalker, even though he's only mono red in his iteration. But beyond that, 
why why is he at Shiv? Well, we don't, we don't know. Mm. Like beyond, oh, it's a place where dragons are, which kind of makes sense in a kind of like if they just want to give a basic amount of information. Because I mean, I mean, original Jumpstart did a similar thing, right? If we pl- throw the various different planes around various different um various different characters we don't necessarily know where they're from it's just like oh here's just some more characters doing other things like where's tiny bones from sure. i don't know do you know yeah that kind of thing yeah it's, i think it's a lack of context that makes them feel alienated from the rest of the game yeah can i can i just say this might be this is going to get me in trouble with a lot of orthos i i i really don't like sarkin's dragon arms as a whole concept <laughs> is that bad <laughs> I i'm feel so like sorry it's a bit sarkin strange. fans so does he metamorphose right, this is, let's, let's tangent because this is more interesting conversation. <laughs> does so, so does does his wrists become throats that's like how thought. much of that's it does exactly he metamorphose right like where is it coming is it like how is where is that fire coming from and also at what point did he think hands you know great let's make them into dragon heads like why not just blast fire out of your dragon can't he yeah. yeah, so why turn your hands also into... Dra- why not also your feet? Why not have rocket feet? Oh my god, so <laughs> well, rocket, why have rocket feet. feet you know what I mean? <laughs> he can actually can literally grow wings. Uh, no. it's, it's interesting, right? I mean, I, I, I understand they want to make it kind of kind of weird and quirky, but we don't see it really in many other planeswalkers, this idea to kind of transmogrify like just a, a certain part of your like, body. Why, yeah, and why is like, that his power? That's so left field. It's like, no, he can turn into dragons. Even that, I'm always still a little bit like, ah, oh, that kind of makes his character a little less interesting if i'm honest but like yeah yeah imagine if kiora herself could turn to an octopus like it'd be like uh i mean i guess she's already, she's already kind already of a fish, fish but that's not really the point <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um yeah i don't know man like it's isn't so i'm if you haven't told dear listener already i am thinking out loud of this this is the this is one of those episodes where nathan suggested a topic and i was like oh i wonder and i i'm still wondering as we're hitting record because because a lot of magic players only play arena and we can't disregard that it's actually very elitist mm. of us to sit here and be like well it doesn't feel canon or it doesn't feel like real magic because to many 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 people and new players as well for, for as long as arenas come out and indeed many players who've been playing for years who now can only or do want to only play on arena arena is magic the gathering so to them this isn't odd do you know what i mean and that's not to belittle the paper mm. players or the Vorthosians like us who maybe want to own these pieces of artwork. Because that is also a thing as well. That's something to say, is that owning a magic card is like owning a small piece of artwork in a way. Um, which is something we've always spoken about. So I guess for them it is... It isn't any different. And I, I do actually really appreciate the fact that, yes, these, mm. these Planeswalkers, although getting a Davriel card, that's not um, one of the uncommon ones from War of the Spark, like uh, getting a mythic rare Davriel Kane card, only in digital is a little bit galling. I, I kind of like that they've made them like generic Yora, generic Sarkin, generic Davriel. Because imagine if they put in something that was like fucking like super narrative relevant. Do you know what I mean? Like we see Sarkin and he's yeah. like riding the back of a Phyrexian dragon or something, and we're like, what the fuck? Like, what's going on? Oh man, that's don't give them ideas. That's exactly the kind of thing they do. <laughs> <laughs> Like, why is he on mirrored? Oh, you'll, you'll never know. know unless you buy Arena. You're like, oh shit. Um, there is another card. This was a card that I believe I'm just checking now was on. Yeah, it is. It's on the um initial card gallery website. So I'm kind of happy to talk about it. Uh, Lumbering Light Shield, uh, one and a white for a mm. one four creature illusion. Um, no flavor text, obviously. Uh, when Lumbering Light Shield enters the battlefield, target opponent reveals one land card at random from their hand. It perpetually gains perpetually gains this spell cost one more to cast. Blah 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 blah. Whatever. We're not, I'm not playing magic for the fucking abilities. Um, so this is this is Teo Verada, right? This is Teo Verada. It's the same light magic that of that his shield's made of. Exactly. This is the the hint that he's likely to be the white planeswalker because we haven't seen any. We don't. I think we haven't seen any hint of what the green one's going to be yet. Um, so I think yeah, that's pretty obvious. That it's going to be Teo. Mm. Um, which is good. I guess we're going to see a non a non crap Teo card, or at least see what his abilities are outside of making walls. Yeah, unless it's just he makes walls. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, you know? sure. But, but he yeah, can be so. a wall planeswalker. Like that's kind of cool. I hope they don't like they. Well, they've mm. well, this this card's pivoted him into making illusions. True, I guess. Where, where's what? What? What was his wall? They were just walls, right? The ones that he made before. Let me just quickly check. Oh, I bet they're not. I bet they are going to be like constructs or illusions or something. Yeah, let me just double check quickly. Uh, no, just wall, just wall, wall, mm. wall creature token. So you're fine. Yeah, Good. I mean, technically well, they are illusions, right? Like, I mean, I, I get. No, I mean, they're not. They're what, what makes things. an illusion? They're not illusions. illusions. I, oh, okay, I get. Hmm. But how can an illusion have power 
and and toughness if it doesn't have physical corporate i mean talk, like, talk to jace Bellerin about that shit that's all i'm saying you know what i mean like okay, <laughs> yeah. fine cool all right i'd admit yeah okay right so yeah it is a branch a little bit i guess maybe it's an evolution of his power yeah again we don't know where we are with him right i mean he could be this could be a few years on like it could be a little bit older for all we know we don't know where it is i'm looking at this lumbering light shield and it's just generic citizens in the background so it might be yeah. generic could, fantasy could be in... citizens he's also yeah. in um baffling defenses as well actually now looking at it oh that is oh right yeah so they have yeah that okay, is him, yeah. yeah absolutely and that looks more like theros potentially and um, baffling and then the other one lumbering light shield that could also be theros maybe some theros uh, maybe he's testing his faith. Who knows? Again, we're not. This is the problem, right? So we're not necessarily going to get a context for why we have to kind of assume things, right? Even if it does yeah. add nuance to his character and his abilities, and kind of gives him a bit more like card development, it doesn't necessarily give him any character development unless we see something really significant in one of the card art season. I think one of the reasons this feels kind of odd from like a um, sort of visual optics perspective, and indeed this is this goes into the play aspect of it as well, is that this isn't the first time that they've done digital exclusive versions of cards on arena we had amonkhet remastered which is when they as the name suggests remastered amonkhet and they added in new cards and they also gave new art to cards that were already established so they added in things like anger of the gods got a new artwork by oh i'm gonna butcher this name i'm so sorry uh egot uh crow glue and we also got things like Collected Company and Hornet Queen. Wrath and, of like, God oh, as well, right? Wrath of God. Like, even, but then even things like Approach of the Second Sun got new art, and that was already in the set. So, mm. you know, and it, is, it isn't something new that they do have new artworks. I suppose it's because they're new, they're new cards, right? They're brand new cards. Because even Magic Online, we always talk about how Magic Online gets all these exclusive artworks. I mean, if you're just talking about Seb McKinnon, Stasis, Kumbaj, Witches, and Sterling Grove, up until recently, were only on... Um, and um, Crucible of the Worlds. And Crucible, Crucible of the Worlds, world. yeah. yeah. Avoid, so, sorry, Crucible of the Worlds. Yeah. Mm, so, so, yeah, so I, 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 it's, just, it's just so interesting that this isn't a new concept. And I think that's why they felt comfortable doing it, right? As They, as in Wizards of the Coast. Because they were like, well, we've already been doing this for ages with our Mukgo. We've already done this with Amon Kemp Remastered. We know we're remastering a bunch of other sets. Like, how long is it until... OG Innistrad draft is going to come to to Arena. Do you know what I mean? And they'll add mm. in new cards, and they'll or they'll put in new artworks or whatever. Um, and so yeah, and because Jumpstart, so Jumpstart as well, I think they were emboldened because Jumpstart came out just as the as the pandemic was really gripping, right? And people just couldn't go to LGSs and all that kind of thing. And obviously, it was like meant to be the most sociable constructed format, <laughs> or sorry, limited format that they had ever printed because it was literally about you have to open packs for people. You can't just sort of like, you know, you pick the packs out the box, you open them there, you smush the decks together, you go. And you need to do that with other people. And with it being on Arena, obviously that meant that people could do it. Like I played a shit ton of jump. I think I've played Arena more playing Jumpstart than I did any other time. I barely play Arena, but when Jumpstart was on there, I was dropping quite a lot of money because it was so much fun. And it was, you know, it was a really good format. So I think the success of OG Jumpstart has made them want to push out the boat more. Because it, it sort of feels a little bit like a draft unset. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because it, yeah, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like either Conspiracy or Battle of One of It just has that quirk to it that kind of going, hooks you a little bit more into it. And obviously mm. Wizards and always wants that little hook that keeps you coming back. Like you can keep releasing like baseline sets and people will, you know, the ebb and flow of, of people's interest, depending on what the format is, uh, or sorry, the setting is, will uh, dictate whether or not they invest more or less into it. Like some people didn't like Strixhaven, some people love D&D, you know, those kinds of things. Whereas if you put a slightly different twist on the format itself as a intellectual, rather than as a creative like my 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 playing brain the part of it that wants to play magic because it's an interesting engaging um play experience that's the thing that people want right they want just something a bit straight like people love cube drafting and things like that they love they love doing those kind of things that are just unconventional to the normal sets so i mean yeah i mean it's it was kind of a no-brainer and i think jumpstart is a really really cool idea and it's very easy for them to kind of go let's create little packages right little flavor packages i like obviously they did like life gain and angels and zombies in the original jumpstart um, and they're able to do similar things here where they get to go, oh, let's just chuck a load of random hodgepodge of like different powerful effects together and put them into a little pack. And then everyone gets to, and you, as you say, mash, mash them together and have like interesting different uh, combinations and kind of working out what the best combinations are, um, or working out which, which ones are absolutely terrible. And then getting the, the god, the god pool where you get the two packs or like two of the same pack and you end up doing mm-hmm. amazingly well. Like, that's, that's exciting.
exciting, right? That's really enjoyable and engaging for people. And if you've got new cards that do new interesting things, that's like an extra step further in that kind of like intrigue and interest and investment into the into the format and into the play. So yeah, I mean, I, I completely understand. I mean, Jumpstop is always going to be successful. I think it just kind of got held back by the fact they went what else can we be doing with this if we're going to be making an arena exclusive format? And then mm. that's where the question of well, what abilities can we do? What functionality can we apply to the um, to the client that we can't do in Paper Magic? And the problem is that when you do that and you do a card that's quite cool or you do something that doesn't feel too outside of what is po- possible, people just go, well, what do you mean you can't print that in paper? And then that's where the, I think that disassociative aspect comes into it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I'm not more angry about this. This is exactly the kind of thing where I would be like, what the fuck, they can't do this. This is ridiculous. Because it's all about, you know, as we've been saying about accessibility. I just think they, if they were ever going to do this, this kind of has been pitched sort of okay. At least from mm. my perspective. I could be completely way off base and actually it turns out to be like, oh no, this was a very bad move. But the fact that they have gone for abilities and things that the card can do that really are only readable on arena i mean maybe that's a harbinger for a much much larger issue down the line where we start getting whole sets that are only going to be on arena because that's the yeah. next step isn't it that that's this the big thing. this this being jumpstart and this being like what i was sort of ham-fistingly describing as sort of the unset of draft formats because it's kind of just fun and a little bit throwaway and you know it's not it's not magic as it's like corely played then Maybe it's sort of fine that this is how they do it, but as soon as it's like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna have arena standard, or whatever. I mean, well, that's I mean, I guess they sort of do. They have all different kinds of arena formats, but they'll have like you know a, a format which you know you play exactly one way in paper, and it's a completely different format, although it's presented to you the same like on arena. I think that's where things start to get a little bit tricky. If they released cards that were that were narratively relevant and we had all the information from them so say we had a card which had flavor text artwork and the ability would you would you mind would it affect your approach to the story and the narrative of what's going on even though you have all the same information i think so i think my question would be why isn't this also available in paper Mm. like a lot of these cards just simply i think they've deliberately pushed most of these cards to be unplayable typically in paper magic which is kind of interesting from a design point of view because it makes them go well none of these can just have typical functionality what what can we do to make these specifically only viable um online but if you were then to start going um let's introduce a new setting Right, like technically speaking, Sarkin on Shiv is a new setting for a character that we have we've seen before. You know, it's technically a step in in the story. The fact they've left him generic and they have all they all they show him doing is going Sarkin standing next to a dragon, Sarkin setting <laughs> fire to something, Sarkin setting fire to something, standing next to a dragon. Like that's yeah, fine. Literally. I don't I don't I don't mind. Like that's not an issue. But as soon as you go like say faceless agent, and I'm like, well, what what where 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 is it from? Why has it got some? Why does it look like a Dementor? Why has it got? Mm. Ha- it's, it's when I start having to ask questions that you're not going to, be able to give me answers to that I start to feel a bit annoyed because you've kind of given me half information and that the rest of the information isn't accessible. And if you started introducing settings, as you say, like flavor text and character developments that I wasn't able to have physically in my hand, unless there was a really good reason for it, will I be too annoyed from uh, understanding the story of, of magic? Not, not really. Will I be frustrated that I can't then make a theme deck around that because there's certain mm-hmm. cards that I can't get access to? Absolutely. Like, yeah. It doesn't feel right to print these off and have them sat as proxies in a deck, right? Especially when, even though some of the abilities are very grockable, some of them just simply do not work. Yeah. So I guess at that point, if you make things that I can't work in Paper Magic, but you give me a story that needs to be a part of Paper Magic, then that's where I'd get frustrated. Yeah, for sure. I think that's something I was chatting to someone on Twitter about was, like, what what would be the line for like EDH players and what could they do? And I was thinking, well, they, I'm sure there'd be very few tables. There'd probably be even less people annoyed. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll start this thought again. If you're, if you are not necessarily hundred percent on people using proxies, I think the, the barometer of where your line is, if someone rocked up with an arena exclusive legendary, that was playable. It wasn't like an un, un commander. It was like, Oh no, that is perfectly viable as a commander and you proxied that up, I think people's tolerance would be a lot higher. <laughs> they were like, yes, of course you can proxy that commander because he doesn't physically exist in paper. Like, let's go. So proxies are an option like for people to have these have these on the thing. I, I, I will be interested to see if they sell like playmats with some of this art on 
because I don't, for me personally, this is I was gonna say, I, are they still going to do artist prints? Oh yeah, no, because they're not right? printing like, the cards. Are they going to be accessible? But they did still have to do the art, right? They still printed. They still had to like physically make the piece of artwork to submit it. Right? Well, this is a whole other discussion. These available to people. This this is a whole other mm. discussion. So, uh, I've seen various different threads and conversations and chats with people talking about. Well, you know, if artists are artists are predominantly working in digital anyway, so it's not like it's that big of a deal. And then some people are like, well, you know, a lot of artists are traditional and bloody bloody blah, blah, blah. I actually don't think a lot of that. I could be very wrong and very naive. I don't think a lot of that is is it worth a conversation because if you're a traditional artist you still have to scan and send in your painting for it to be a card anyway and if you're working digital i i mean i don't know the steps that is goes into sending in your artwork like once you're once you're submitting it but i don't i can't imagine there's it's any more tricky or any less tricky to send it in if it's just a digital product because that's not what you're dealing with um i wonder if there's anything to be said for the composition because obviously arena cards do just look like magic cards just in a digital version if that makes sense but i wonder if the more arena goes and the more it kind of evolves and develops whether magic cards will start looking very different on arena and it actually might open up design space for artists to do di very different things like i wonder how artists feel we should ask some artists if if i mean we know a few i'm sure we could ask them how they feel about seeing their artwork on mythics like uh like questing beast or whatever else when it's hit hits the table on arena and it does like that little animation oh god i love it when you say the thought that's in my head as i'm thinking it Cause, <laughs> yeah because what what if they what if people get specifically requested to go right you're going to do this legendary and then obviously they have to like do that animation and do they specifically then commission something that's easier to animate or do they get to does the artist give them a bit a few different versions to help with the animation effects like that's a really interesting conversation because I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I was literally thinking as you were saying, I was like, yeah, what about the animations when people have mythics and, you know, they come out and kind of like the um, the game night thing of where they kind of edit the, the, the card to kind of have a little bit more, you know, life to it, mm. that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, game yeah. nights. But like if anyone's not been watching game nights recently because they put out so much like content that sometimes it's, you just don't have time to watch it all do keep watching the gameplay videos like i don't think i need to promote game nights or extra turns i think they've they do a very good job themselves i hear <laughs> um but <laughs> i i hear a certain pop star was on a recent one i don't know post posty man mr post i don't fucking know um but their animations and some of the stuff they've been doing with the the card art is is been pretty special and i think that's going to become more common i think more people are going to be doing that because they just just on a slight sort of tangent as content creators, you always slightly worry about where your copyright lines lie. Like, I remember when mm. we started doing YouTube videos and thumbnails and things, we were like, well, when are we going to get slapped on the wrist for changing images or using images or any of this kind of stuff? And it turns out, as long as you're nice about it, Wizards of the Coast pretty much like you do what you want because they know you like the game. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think people are going to be sort of... I think the more, the more art ends up online and the more art becomes, like, manipulated digitally... Like I think, I think that's the way to go. I mean, Jeffrey Palmer's the, who, the one who does all the living card animations, but but they're not the only one, and like lots of people do different things. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. This is just it's so it's just so surreal in every situation. Mm. But I just can't. Outside of, I don't want magic to be different online than in paper, just simply because I don't want to have the the fear of missing out. I just, I just don't know how angry I am about it. Like, I still have everything I need to enjoy the game. Maybe I'm just being really soft on it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very much. Um, I take a step. I take a step back and just watch the kind of every watch the dust settle a little bit. I mean, there's been a lot of a media outrage. I can completely understand why because there is a feeling of this is men momentum in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. but in so many little ways that I can kind of it's hard to pick out the ones that I believe in or the ones I, I, I hold my own opinion to and be like okay if this continues this might be something that I'm concerned about whereas other ones I'm like oh who cares we've got random effects in the game like we've literally just had a set with dice rolling in it and you because mm -hmm. this is one of my arguments was that if you suddenly have to have six or seven different dice to be able to play your latest commander deck does having a random effect or like you know like time of the infinite okay it's one one of ten random spell effects isn't that kind of a bit more fun 
Like, isn't that the whole mm. point? Is that if you've got RNG in your game, at least make the RNG fun. And I get from a constructive point, constructed point of view, it can kind of ruin the game a little bit because if you make something that's a bit too strong or has massive variants of it being that you get this effect and it wins you the game or you get this effect and it's completely useless, then you can't really competitively make the card viable. But then if you do and you get lucky, it's kind of like an outlier. Like there's no mm. consistency there. Like I can get it from that point of view, but again, they're kind of already introducing these effects into the game. I don't see a lot. Of, I don't see D10s and D20s and everything becoming like a mainstay. Um, if we ever do do D and D sets again, obviously they'll come back again. Uh, but mm. it is interesting that it's back to back that we've got you know a, an RNG effect that's within the set game proper, and then an RNG which this is still technically game proper, but it's not you know it's a format specific mechanic. Mm. Whereas D and Ds can be played in any format. So maybe, and again, I didn't see any outrage about the dice rolling and stuff. So I'm like, well, just because there's an easy comparison. Also, it's digital, right? So it's very easy to compare this to Hearthstone because they're both digital format games. Yeah. But at the same time, I think Davril's uh, second ability, which ri- written down is funny, accept one of Davril's offers, then accept one of Davril's conditions. <laughs> Flavorfully, that's really cool. It doesn't yeah. say, it doesn't mean anything if you don't know anything outside of the cards, you know, like, but, and then I look through like all of the different options. I'm like, man, there's a real like actual head scratcher moment because a lot of the abilities that he has or the, a lot of his offers are really cool. And his conditions are really like kind of, bad you know and it's kind of a real nice interesting like that sounds exactly the kind of thing that Davriel a soul broker would do like so flavorfully I feel like the mechanic kind of reinforces his character more than anything else but I can understand also why with certain other cards it doesn't feel right like you know like the um or supposed to be the pool of vigorous growth of where you discard a card and create a token that's a copy of a random creature with converted mana cost x it's like more mythic right which is a, a really, really popular format. Like, it's a really popular format in MTGO, which is basically you pay mana... Um, it's like having an avatar or an emblem of where you can pay X to create a random creature of mana value X. They brought, it to, of... a, they brought it to Arena as well. Yeah, I heard it. They pulled it because it didn't work properly. <laughs> like, I remember... It really didn't. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I guess they tried again, and they're going to see if it works now, and maybe they've sorted out some back-of-house stuff that maybe works for it. Um, but and... Davriel Soulbroker's second ability, I think... What well, this would cause its own outrage, I think, would work if you had like a little, like you know, you had, get those checklist cards in the back of booster packs. Yeah, well, and they Urza, just had a list like, of all his, yeah. Urza did it. They had the fucking website, a specific page that's still active where you can just roll yeah. the dice to see what effect you get, and that's from an unset. So, and if they're going to support that, I don't see how this wouldn't be also potentially supported. Yeah, exactly. That check checklist card because there's, yeah, there's like one one in twenty, I think, or something stupid that you can get with um with Urza. But you abilities. know what people would say? People would then go. But why do I need another magic card to explain what this magic card does? <laughs> That's what uh, they would well, say. Well, why do we have checklist cards for transform cards when when you don't have sleeves? Exactly. All right, come on, <laughs> come, come on. Oh, oh, I need to have another magic card. You've got forty million cards in your collection. What are you complaining about having to have one more magic card for? Like, come on. I like how I just you created see? that outrage out of thin air. I should yeah, work we... in the newspapers. <laughs> I, yeah, this is the thing. We're great at creating um, false narratives that allow us yeah. to have a, an outrage rebuttal to. <laughs> and then riling against it. Yeah, yeah justify my 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 my, uh, my outrage. Yeah, God damn I mean... this thing that I said. Someone said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, interesting, right? Um, I'm also looking through now. I'm looking at one of these cards, Sky Shroud Ambush. It looks like Fraley's is going to be our green. Yeah, I thought that too. So yeah, Teo is definitely the white one because if you notice, mm. actually, all of the all of the Planeswalkers seem to have an associated card with them, right? If not mm. two. So yeah, so yeah, Teo is going to be the white one, and I did think that looked a lot like Fraley's as well. Which is interesting because from a time story point of view, I guess these really ah, are so divorced. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? So it kind of no. this, this kind of shows that it doesn't matter for the other ones. Um, I also, I, I, I just yeah, there's only one flavor thing here that really that really not riles me, but kind of makes me go, well, you tried to sneak that in, and that's subversive acolyte, okay. and that's a black black two two creature human. Two, pay two life, choose one, activate only once. Already this is a mouthful with the fucking arena cards. Um, and it becomes, basically, Subversive Acolyte either becomes a human cleric and gains plus one, plus two, and gains lifelink. Or Subversive Acolyte becomes a Phyrexian. It gains plus three, plus mm. three, gains trample, and whenever this creature is dealt damage, sacrifice that many permanents. Basically, it becomes a Phyrexian negator, which is like the original mm. big bad. I think it was like three mana for a five, five. does the same thing. 
Now, this is clearly not on Mirrodin. Sure, this brickwork, yeah. Yeah, this kind of, this makes me feel like this is going, hey, you remember that plane that Elspeth came from in her original, like, comic stories, which we've never seen and we never know about, what we know has Phyrexians on it, that are completely mm. divorced from the rest of the Phyrexian, um, the Phyrexians we see on Mirrodin, which also creates this, imagine if we get Phyrexian on Phyrexian, like, f- factions of Phyrexians against each other in multi in a multiversal war. Like, that's, that's already really interesting. But the fact that we're seeing confirmation of Phyrexians in a time where all we're seeing and all we're hearing is the Mirrodin or the new Phyrexian kind of thing these this doesn't look like a new Phyrexian this looks like an old Phyrexian Mm. and that's one of those things of like that's a big story implication if you're just dropping it in for whatever reason why why not just make it any other creature why why not just do a different go for a different thing of it being either a good guy or a bad guy because flavor implications i really like it of where you kind of choose the story of this of this character and you choose whether it becomes a good guy and becomes a three four life linking cleric or if it becomes a fucking phyrexian negator i think that's a really cool idea and it's a shame that we can't see i don't see how this also can't be implemented in normal magic where we have the out uh, the siege cycle right like outpost siege and um monastery siege where you have to choose one of them and the card is continually that i think the reason why subversa so acolyte doesn't work is because that effect works outside of the battlefields or you can't even if it you blink it or whatever I, I don't know there's there's probably a way that makes it not work in paper even though i think it probably should but the fact that they've squirreled that bit of phyrexian knowledge or phyrexian story into 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 an, a non-paper format is a bit a little frustrating. Yeah, that is maybe a, maybe a big one. I mean, is, have they said these cards will never be printed in paper? I mean, I think for the most part, I'm looking at all of them now, and I don't think there's very many that you can just simply from a because we have we really haven't actually talked about any of the abilities. Like the ability seek um, basically actively goes searches from the top of your deck through your deck until it hits the card of the type that you're supposed to be getting. Say for example, faceless agent, three colors for a two one changeling shapeshifter. When it enters the battlefield, seek a creature card of the most prevalent creature type in your library. Now you can't without cheating and showing your entire deck to someone show like this is I've, I've got mostly elves in my deck mm. you know like it's, it's it's things that are like where it kind of does a check like for your for the for the um the numbers within your deck and, and it feeds from that naturally because it already knows all the cards did it already knows automatically all the cards in your deck because you had to kind of select them and put them in there um conjure as well like puts cards into your hand like token copies of cards into your hands but they're not token copies they're just a, a copy of that card that you didn't have in your deck say for example mm. wingsteed trainer three and a white for a two three enter the battlefield or attacks conjure a storm front pegasus into your hand flavorfully amazing enter the battlefield you get a pegasus he comes attacking at you he jumps on a pegasus that makes sense to me right but again you can't do that without actively having a pile of storefront pegasus is next to you or a, or a pile of uh, token cards next to you and also they still go to the graveyard afterwards it's like these kinds of things these kinds of effects of where i don't think it's possible to perpetually technically very grockable is it a rules nightmare or is it is it hard for upkeep absolutely you know giving mm. a creature perpetually z- uh, zero power um, uh, which is baffling defense is one and a white target creature's base power becomes perpetually zero as an instant that means if it goes to the graveyard if it's exiled if you get shuffled into your library and you draw it later any of these things it's constantly got zero i think that's really yeah, cool sort of, yeah but it sort of changes a real fundamental of the game though like yes. more than many other rules do and that's the thing as soon as and that's that's it's not just that the fact the cards are doing slightly different things and mechanics to me it's kind of changing the way the game works and the fact that you've got two different styles of play and the fact that the game works differently imagine playing this format and then going into paper magic or go or playing paper magic exclusively going into this and being like what the fuck is perpetual what do you mean it goes and like that's already confu- again confusing and disassociative and the fact that all three of these abilities are i mean i don't think seek's particularly complicated it's just cascade without all the extra steps and mm. um, without the shuffling and all that kind of thing so i can understand but i think for the most part they've deliberately made cards that just just simply do not work within the game and the fact that they've done that means that they kind of have to push these cards to into a, into a space that doesn't necessarily feel as magic cardy like garth one-eyed as much as it's as much as you're choosing five different iconic magic cards it doesn't he doesn't feel very magic cardy the fact you can go and select and like you can choose a random card and mm. suddenly you can play that like it's cool because it's Garth, and he's a throwback to all of the old school magic. But like Tomb of the Infinite, it's a very similar effect of where you conjure a random card from a spell book. And that spell book, I think it's like 10 to 12 different spells long. It's got things like Swords to Plowshares, Ponder on it. Like you vary, varying different effects to the point of where you can't say if the card's good or not when you activate it. You know, you're not necessarily going to get what you need or even slightly close to something useful, which makes it less annoying. But it, again, that's very similar to Garth One Eyes. But one of the one of them feels very much like a like one of them feels more like a magic card because of the flavor of his character, whereas the other one kind of feels very much like 
this isn't what magic cards normally do. And as soon as you start mm. getting into that and lean into it more, I think that's where the problem will start to, to lie. And then when you start going, well, how do we make it continue to feel magic-y? Well, let's keep putting it in magic settings. And then those settings start feeling divorced from the rest of the game. That's maybe where we can start to see the, the, the problems that people are um, instinctively kicking back about against, even if they're not necessarily wording it as succinctly. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah, it's odd. It's an odd time for magic, but I yeah, I don't know. I just, I just don't know. I think it's I think it's fine now, but this definitely mm. opens a lot of doors to some very odd places, and I wouldn't I wouldn't want to see full sets on arena. I think that would no. be that'd be terrible. Um, let's talk about some of the artwork because these are magic cards and they do have artwork. There are three cards that jump out to me just from the ones that have kind of been revealed so far. Obviously, we are still in the the middle of spoiler season. Um. I'll talk about two of them, I think. One of them is Ethereal Grasp by Miranda Meeks, is the artist. Uh, Miranda Meeks is really creating a very cool visual style. The other cards that are notable from uh, Miranda Meeks are the uh, Arche Mender and Indulging Patrician from mm-hmm. Original Jumpstart and M21 uh, specifically. Completely different subject matter. So Arche Mender is the the one where it's the the wizard mending the pot with that Japanese I can't remember the name of it, I know I did say it in the episode we spoke about it, but it's them mending the pot with the gold filament. Yeah, to celebrate yeah. the breakage, it's like a exactly. yeah, celebration of the scars, yeah. And then Indulgent Patrician is that very striking vampire noble where it's the the female vampire holding the the kind of fainting uh, prince, if you like. That's they kind of flipped around the kind of the classic sort of, you know, like male vampire with the fainting like damsel. Um, but it's got that big pink moon behind it. Oh, mm. really cool. And just Stunning. Ethereal Grasp is, co- again, completely different. It's an ethereal hand coming out of a portal to come and grab someone, and there's a bunch of like leaves blowing around everywhere as well. But I just, there's just something about the kind of centralized composition of the, the main subject matter with a foreground um, subject as well. And like just the, the really super bold colors, like in Indulging Progression, it's all pinks and blacks. In Archaea Mensa, it's all pinks and blues. And in Ethereal Grasp, it's like blood red and blues as well. And it's yeah, this kind of two tone look. I think it's it's really cool. It's a very cool piece of artwork. I'd actually I'd love to have that on a regular magic card. Mm. And then the other one is um again Magali Villeneuve who shared uh her Cura um artwork. Um and Cura looks fucking powerful as shit in his artwork. <laughs> She's walking towards the the sort of frame of view with the Biden, which she saw from Thassa, and there's a big octopus. So like generally quite Kiori stuff. But it's just it's cool to see another figure from Magali Villeneuve where the costuming is actually very minimal because Kiora doesn't wear like fabric clothes because they're a merfolk and they have just like coral armor which is sort of like very sort of like minimal. How how do you tailor coral? Difficult. Like with difficulty, yeah, right. <laughs> like, well, I suppose, like, no, how do you I, make well, these? <laughs> I suppose if you live in the ocean, mm. even in one ocean, let alone all of the multiverse's oceans, you could probably just find exactly what you need just by virtue of the numbers. Sure. <laughs> You're like, if I look long enough, I'll find like a, a breastplate which fits exactly right. <laughs> sure. Um, and yeah, it's just interesting to see Magali uh, illustrate a piece where the costuming is kind of already decided for them because as when we when we had the interview with Magali, like she was saying how a big part of all of her compositions is that she gets to design the outfits and the costumes and it's a huge part of like what she's all about. So yeah, to have Kiora be one of the subjects. It's got big Clothis energy, I think. Clothis being another Magali Villeneuve up piece where yeah. it's just like very slight powerful. Up, slight up angle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, it's a very good uh, Kiora artwork because I like Kiora as a character and I like almost all the cards that Kiora's on. But this one's like this one's got real attitude, and I'm, yeah, it's really cool, really good. Mm. Yeah, I like how we mocked um, Sarkin's dragon arms, but I mean the Sarkin arc by by Darken, Darken Sarkin, um, Darken is, Sarkin on yeah. uh, Sarkin Scorn, Dar- yeah, Sarkin. Darken Sarkin on Sarkin Scorn, amazing. <laughs> oh, good, I love it. Yeah, it's really really good. Again, I'm a big fan of fire. I don't know why. I'm like in terms of um, it's very easily it's done it's done it's done to death. But every time I see it done well. Because I think I mentioned this on Collider Scorch as well um, from uh, the last set that we were talking about. And I was like, just, I like bright colours and I like the fact that some people do like 
um, kaleidoscopic colors when it comes to uh, fire, where they do that kind of like peachy, pinky, purpley kind of vibrancy at the beginning of the flame. Because obviously flames can technically be all colors based on what it is it's burning. Um, mm. um, and I just like dark and artwork. I'm glad that he's, uh, he's a mainstay. Um, yeah. The thing is, I'm interested to see what else they do again it's kind of one of these if you do really like the artworks it's kind of a bit annoying that you can't then get hold of it and again maybe we'll look into whether if prints are going to be available because again for people that do do physical artworks i'd be surprised if they don't still find ways to uh, market their prints and things like that you know it would be a shame if they're not accessible outside of mtg arena do we have any mtg arena exclusive artworks been available as playmats i don't think so right i mean in the uk we still haven't got our Strixhaven play playmats so i wouldn't know <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Yeah, good point. It's just like, maybe I have to look into that as well. Because I guess if that's point, if depending on how many aspects of these cards are exclusive, I think is the kind of is kind of the the issue. Um, again, mechanics wise, that's fine. There's certain things that don't work in terms of um, again storyline. Thankfully, they haven't done any of that yet. Um, though I do have questions about some of these cards. But like, well, where's where's this from? I want to know more. Show me more. And I don't think mm. we're going to get more because you don't get the say the context. You're not going to get a story article about it. You're not going to get the flavor text. Um, yeah, I guess I guess that is the big takeaway. I guess that is the thing that I'm sad about. And like I, we've sort of been going around in circles in this episode because I guess we're just sort of mulling it all over. But yeah, the biggest upset for me is not so much that I know these cards aren't hugely impactful from a Vortho standpoint. I do have the art and their abilities do tell a story. But the fact that there's very little context around them, like it just feels like yet another core set but now it's a corset that I can't even own in my hand, which is just weird. So yeah, I guess yeah, I guess nail I'm on the head. It is does feel corsetty. It feels almost like diluted Coca Cola of where it's like it's weird, fizzy, weird, crazy kind of flavor thing that some people hate, some people love, but they've also added a bit of water to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's kind of it. I, I understand this episode's been a little bit sort of. <laughs> hesitant because i just yeah i just i wasn't i didn't want to come in all guns blazing i didn't want to be like oh fuck this this is awful because uh, yeah like i just don't feel that way but at the same Mm. time i just i don't know if i love it or hate it and the implications are worrisome but hopefully hopefully they'll toe the line sort of correctly um listeners please do tell us what you think of jump stark jump jump stark bakark banak jump start (laughs) It's the Sarkin effect. Historic Horizons? <laughs> that is what it's Historic called, isn't horizons. it? Yeah, like, I always said yeah. one Horizons. G-S-H-H. God, yeah. like, G- I understand. G-S-J-S-H. I get that it's because they're adding in cards from Modern Horizons and his- and it's Historic. But but t- there are lots of words in the world mm-hmm. that you mm-hmm. could use. Some in other languages, even, maybe. <laughs> Stop mm-hmm. just using what like mythic is like when they use mythic for fucking everything. You're like, well, now it means nothing. So stop it. Um, do tell us what you think of this set and what you think of there being exclusive cards. Um, yeah, it's an odd one. It is a strange one. So do let us know. You can hit us up on Twitter at MT Flavoring. Emails go to mtflavoring at gmail.com. My Twitter is at Andy Manface. Nathan's your Twitter is at at the Fox in the Moon. Uh, and yeah. It's been crazy weather here in the UK. Yesterday it was blistering sunshine, then showers for an hour, then blistering sunshine, then showers for an hour, and I got caught in every single heavy downpour. And like to the point where London is very flooded right now. Um, I don't know where how it's like where you are, Nathan. Um, I'd, I, yesterday I was stuck in at work in London as well, and it was it was torrential for about two and a half hours, and then yeah. either side of it you just got a, a burst of lovely sunshine. There was a, there was double rainbow all all all, all across all, all across the sky. I have no idea what it means. Um, it was very pretty. <laughs> well there we go let us know if you see a double rainbow as well Yay. message that in if you want to know pictures if possible all that remains <laughs> for me to say then is thank you so much for listening this has been Magic the Flavouring we'll see you soon